everybody follows what's going on. So last study butterflies, as Steve uh, pointed out, and uh, when I take you through the, when he says, well, I have a passion for it, uh, I'll try and share that passion, and perhaps when you step out of this hall, maybe some of you will start observing butterflies after that. That is my sincere hope. So, um, well, I'll take you through the basics very quickly. I realize I have very little time. Steve, could you give me a signal when my time's up? Thank you. Um, butterflies and moths, they form a group called the Lepidoptera. So if you touch an insect and the color comes off in your hand, it's a butterfly or a moth. And the color that comes off in your hand are these tiny scales, oh, sorry, what did I do? Are these tiny scales on the wings. It's like powder. And the, the patterns on a butterfly's wing are made up of the process of pointillism. You know, Van Gogh did it. Little, little dots make up the pattern on the wing over there. Hmm? So, now, of course, all insects have six legs, so anything with six legs, and you touch it and the color comes off as a butterfly or a moth. There are very many different shapes. Some of them are wingless. There are all sorts of, all sorts of things going on. Hmm? Now, we come to the thing of what is the distinction between a butterfly and a moth. Everybody who comes to the museum sooner or later asks me that. And the truth is, there is no distinction. Um, these words were thought up in English villages where, you know, brightly colored day flying things were called butterflies and the little brown things that, that flew around at night were called moths. So as, as far as that goes, it's very valid, it's good. When they came to the tropics, they discovered that uh, there were very many day flying moths. In fact, there are more day flying moths than all butterflies put together. There are about 20,000 species of butterflies and there are more day flying moths. So the day flying, night flying business didn't work. <laughs> then they said all butterflies sit with the wings folded over the back and moths sit with the wings either held flat or held like a tent. And again they found a heap of moths who sat with their wings folded over their back. That didn't work. <laughs> then they said um, moths have thick bodies and butterflies have thin bodies. And they found some very, very slim moths and some very, very fat butterflies. <laughs> didn't work. So finally they came down to the antenna. They had to justify the word. So they came to the antenna and they said everything that has got a an antenna ending in a swelling is a butterfly and everything, well, okay, these are butterflies and there's a group in between whose antennae end in a hook so they're called skippers so they're included in butterflies nowadays there's nothing, no real justification and everything else was a moth heterocera, varied <laughs> clubs so they put a, there are more than 20 different types of antennae for moths these are some of the antennae. You see, you have you have feathery antennae. You have I don't, I don't, I don't know what to call that. You know, uh, antennae with these things on it. You have flattened antennae. You have extremely long antennae. This little fellow, his antennae end over there. You see, his, the antennae are many times the size of the moth. What, how he uses them and what he uses them for, we have the faintest idea. So anyway, but there are very many different types of antennae for moths. And of course, then in South America. There is a family of moths with clubbed antenna. So then they said, you see, uh, okay, you know where the four winged creatures, right? So you have the upper wing and the lower wing. And when they flap their wings, so why don't the wings come apart? So that the lower wings stay there and the upper wings come down with the muscles on the upper wing. But they travel together because there is an area of overlap. And in butterflies, the area of overlap is strengthened. So the upper wing carries the lower wing with it. And in moths, there's a sort of a flap on one wing and a bristle on the other wing. And that bristle fits into the flap and then that locks the wings together. So if they have clubbed antennae and just an overlap, it's a butterfly. And if they have clubbed antennae and that flap and, and the bristle, it's a moth. This is stupid. So the point of the matter is there is no distinction. If you have a spectrum of butterflies and moths, the Lepidoptera, you have primitive moths, tiny little fellows with chewing parts. They chew pollen and stuff. And then you have mouthless moths, you have wingless moths, you have all sorts of moths. And you have a narrow spectrum of 10,000 butterflies, and then you have the advanced moths. So I, I took a long time to tell you that these words are invalid. <laughs> now, what do they eat? Uh, Lepidoptera, you see, we have a jaw composed of four bones. Left and right upper, left and right lower. Butterflies uh, don't have a lower jaw. It's atrophy. So
So we have the upper jaw extended into two hollow pipes, half a hollow pipe each. And when they come out of the pupae, these pipes are separate, and then they zip them up. And it's such a good zip up that it's airtight. And they keep this very neatly rolled over here. And when they want to eat something, when they want to suck something up, they pump water into that pipe and it straightens out. And they direct it to where they want to think, and they suck up their nutrition up that pipe. Now there is a, there is a, it's a very neat system of, of uh, locating nectar in, in deep flowers. Fine. But there is a drawback. And the drawback is the same as one faces when one tries to suck up a milkshake with a very thin straw. So thin straws are very good as far as soda goes, but the moment it comes into something viscous, it, it doesn't work anymore. So butterflies are restricted to um, sugar sources with less than 10% sugar. So they can suck that up. Anything more than that becomes a bee plant. Bees don't have those, the proboscis, and they can take more, uh, more viscous solutions of sugar back to the hive. In fact, if a bee brings back a 10% sugar solution, the people at the hive will probably kick it. Say, what the heck can we brought back? <laughs> Go and get some sugar. And these, so that's why there's a division between bee plants and butterfly plants. So that's how they, they make the, the cross pollination, they ensure the cross pollination. Now, what do they feed on with that proboscis of theirs? Of course, there's a the flower. Many male butterflies come to perspiration, they need sodium salts to prime their pheromones or their spermatophore to successfully mate. And they come to rotten fruit. Now rotten fruit feeders are very interesting, they do not come to flowers. So or you can have a very good garden and you will find that a large number of butterflies never visit it. But if one day uh, you have some rotten fruit or some dead animal, stinking dead animal or some, somebody you know, so there's some cow, uh, cow dung around or something, you will have dozens or hundreds of these butterflies on that. So the reason for that is that these chaps have very thick bodies and 10% sugar doesn't do for them. So they have gone and located something more potent. And you know what you get in rotten fruit. Brandy. So they are alcoholics. <laughs> you have the fowl feeders who uh, get their calcium sauce from all sorts of uh, waste products. Now I'll just, for the children, I'll just sit through the, the process. These are eggs, butterfly eggs, and that's what comes out of it, and it eats and eats and eats. There's an eating machine. The job of this caterpillar is to just get as much nutrition into it as soon as possible. And when they've got enough nutrition, when they have enough, enough nutrients saved, then they need to grow wings. This, this creature here needs to grow long wings, big wings, long legs, a different head, proboscis, antennae, a different abdomen. The whole shape has to change. Now the simplest way to change the shape of anything is to liquefy it. So it before liquefying itself, it attaches itself to a leaf with some silken thread. And then it makes a shell or a pupil case and this inert pupil case actually manages to shed that caterpillar skin. You don't know how they do it. They wiggle a little bit and somehow it comes off. And when that's done, you have a pupa. Now inside the pupa, the butterfly, had the, the caterpillar has liquefied itself, except for a circulatory system. And it rearranges itself, it rearranges its cells into a butterfly. And here you see the head, that's the eye, the palps, the wing, and that's the abdomen there. Yeah? And when it is ready to come out, when it has completed its development, temperature, humidity are correct, then it comes out of its pupa. A little thing comes out, with the, the body is normal size, but the wings are very, very small. I'm sorry for a very bad photograph. And you see these, these pipes, <coughs> all butterfly wings have this structure, all moth wings also. Um, they have to expand their wings. So they have water in the abdomen and they pump that into these pipes. And under pressure, this, the wings straighten out. And then they hang down. And as the wings straighten, that's the complete butterfly. Yeah? <clears throat> Once it has dried its wings, at this stage the wings are like silk. 
if you touch it, it will get damaged. And once the wings are dry, the butterfly can fly. But of course, it can never change its size. So you don't have butterflies, small butterflies growing into big butterflies. Now, once they have their wings expanded, they cannot fold them up again. You have uh, you know, stick insects and brain mantises and, and grasshoppers and stuff. They have this, this very, very fantastic system where they really lift off their upper wings, the beetles, and click, 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 slap, 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 and they have a huge wing. I mean, if I was a beetle, my wing would probably extend to the end of that wall over there. You know? And they have that thing folded up on their back. That's the size of the, 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 the thing they do. And then they can fly with it. But these chaps, they can't fold their wings. Now, they can't fold their wings, so they cannot change their shape. They cannot disappear into the vegetation. So these wings are like signboards. And they have to carry these signboards around with them and fly around with them and survive all the dangers that, all the challenges that they have. How much time can I stay? Okay. So, um, they, they've adopted various strategies. And that is, they have managed to take poisons from their food plants and store it in their bodies. So if anybody makes the mistake of catching and eating about these butterflies, he'll get a very bad surprise. Um, some of them store aristolochic acid. Aristolochic acid is supposed to make you very sick, but it won't kill you. These chaps store aristolochic acid. And there are some moths that actually manufacture hydrogen cyanide, and they carry it with them. And um, nothing happens to them. And these particular moths, it's a whole family of moths, if you put them in a, in a jar containing potassium cyanide, it has no effect on them whatsoever. So there is a, a way of surviving potassium cyanide, which is have to figure it out. They were really about it. Now, there comes the, uh, you know, you have marketing. So marketing tries to bring a product to the notice of the consumer. Now these chaps have a product, and that's called poison. But they need to bring it to the attention of the consumer, the bird. Now the birds, their parents, birds, frogs, they say, their parents don't tell them what they can eat and what they can't eat. Right? So they have, each new generation has to go and find out for itself what it can. So they go and taste everything in the environment. And sooner or later, every new bird, every new insectivorous bird, is going to catch and kill this guy, one of one of one bird, individual of the species. And once he's caught it, killed it, and tasted it, he's oh, it's terrible. If he eats it, of course, he's over. But uh, if he doesn't, then he knows that anything with a red body and black wings and red and white spots, please stay away. He won't go near it again. Now, of course, they, you have uh, competitors who want to capitalize on your product. So you have these fellows who look the same as that. Yeah? And they reduce the price of advertising the fact that they're poisonous. So one, one of these red and black fellows gets eaten and all the rest, you have, you have complexes of 20 species or 30 species, which all look the same. And they fly in the same area, they behave the same way, everything the same. It's only when you catch them and look at them, you see the difference. In this case, of course, that spot over there is the difference. Right? And um, everything else is the same. But the caterpillar is different, the pupa is different, everything is different. But in the adult, they are different. So this is called Munera mimicry, discovered by Chapman Fritz Muller, where poisonous mimics poisonous to reduce the price of advertising. <laughs> and then you have the chaps who want to make a good thing on it without putting in much effort. So, okay, but before that, um, just to show you that moths and butterflies are the same, these are moths and those are butterflies. Again, a moth and a butterfly. So you see they have co-evolved and got almost the same pattern. These are day-fly moths. Now, uh, there's a very, very, it's very easy to say, okay, they look the same, they behave the same, fine, right? If you ask how, you are at a dead end, you, you, you over very, very deep water. Because these are unrelated things, and how do they modify their shape, their colors, their patterns, and the behavior, and the flying time, how do they coordinate the flying time with something entirely unrelated, and, and put it into practice? That's one heck of a challenge. So these are these are these are questions which science doesn't even ask. We, we stop everything and say they look similar, and that's it. Don't go don't go beyond. Because you have to attribute some sort of uh, thinking process to them, and science vehemently denies that they can think. It's all, all supposed to be instinctive reactions, which is not true. Now here you have the case of chaps who want to capitalize on the poisonous ones. So this chap is not poisonous, but he's got the shape pattern and the colors and the behavior and everything of the poisonous one, right? And one lady who came, uh, one middle-aged lady, she said, look, they've matched the shades of brown and blue perfectly. Now, I come from, my mother was Indian, and she wore saris. 
And anybody who's had a mother who's Indian and who has had a sari presented to her, she went out and bought a sari, they, they know that it'll take another five trips to town to locate a petticoat of the same color and a blouse of the same color and a of the same color and get it stitched on and so on and so forth, right? So matching shades is not easier to do. So these guys did it. These guys did it. How they did it? Again, it's, it's difficult to plumb that. But, um, okay. So, we also have the case where, in many cases, uh, you know, boys and girls look the same, but in some cases the girls want to look different, and we don't know why they look different. In some cases, they're mimicking the poisonous ones, the females mimic the poisonous ones, but in this case, for example, this is a male and a female. Now, why she chose to look different, we don't know. And here's again a male and a female. We believe that the original pattern is the males, and the female thereafter changed to gain some sort of advantage from that pattern. But again, why did the male not change? If there was an advantage to be gained from that, why did this fellow not follow suit? So these are all, all uh, unanswered questions which we haven't even begun to approach. Nobody's been posing these questions. Now here you have a case of a dry season form butterfly and a wet season form butterfly. So the same butterfly can look very different in different seasons. And the reason they're together at the moment is because this one occupied in a place near a stream where there was high atmospheric humidity and this shall be moved away from a stream. And when they emerged, this one was a dry season form, that was the wet season form. And of course they met and it didn't make a difference to them. They're the same species. Now, here we have a case of, when you see, um, the color that is visible to us at all, uh, no, no, regardless of how bright the background is, the color that's visible to us is red. So red is used as a danger signal. The most, most uh, vibrant color visible to us, the most noticeable color is red. Green we can see or not see in bright light, but red we can definitely see. So these chaps are poisonous, and in order to advertise the fact that they're poisonous, they have got very vibrant colors on their wings. So brightly colored butterflies, if they're not cheats and mimicking a poisonous one, are usually poisonous. So these chaps, they want to attract attention to themselves and say, look at us, we are poisonous, stay away from us. Hmm? And incidentally, this is the one of the most beautiful Indian butterflies, called a peacock. Uh, you have them around here in Missouri. So, okay, poisonous butterflies, they want to attract attention to themselves and say, don't look at us. Uh, sorry, please look at us. And the chaps who are not poisonous, they're trying to avert attention. Don't, don't go near them, don't look at us, we're just a dry leaf or something like that, a huh? bit of debris. These butterflies will naturally be found in forests. Now, the best example of camouflage is the orange oak leaf butterfly. Yeah. This, he's sitting, um, he's not feeling threatened, so he's just sitting normally. If he was feeling threatened, these wings, the upper wings, the four wings, would be pulled a bit higher so this line would match with the hind wing. It would become a single line. His antennae would be held within the, that wing, and that head of his would fit into the curve over there. So it would become a perfect leaf except for these two legs. His, the hind legs are there, they're perfectly camouflaged. So you'd have a leaf with two little legs sticking out. Now, this is a very good example of camouflage. If you're walking around, you can be looking at him and you wouldn't believe it's alive. But these chaps from time to time, they have to move. And movement attracts attention in nature. And if they move, they fly. And the bird sees them and sees where the bird sit, so the bird will go and search for it and find it and kill it. Right? So what they have done is not enough to have a very good leaf-like camouflage, but you have to play another trick. And that is called flash coloration. So when it opens its wings, it's an orange and blue butterfly. And when it closes its wings, it's a leaf. So when it flies, you see this orange and blue butterfly go and sit down in that bush. And the bird goes looking for an orange and blue butterfly. And this child in India will become a leaf again. <laughs> These chaps are playing an even uh, dirtier trick. They have figured out that predators try to grab the head of their prey. So the head is usually identified by the presence of eyes. So they have taken the whole hog and gone and painted eyes in misleading positions. Now that is the body of the body. Yeah, the head and the body. If that gets a bird peck or a bite uh, from a from frog or a lizard or something, 
the butterfly will sooner or later die, sleep and gunshot wound. But if a section of the wing is taken off, it doesn't matter. So when these guys go and sit, they flash off the wings, or they sit with the wings closed. And um, of course the chap comes, he never dreams that this is the head of the butterfly. He says, ah, that's it, that's, that's the one, right? And he goes and grabs that, like they grab this one, right? And he got a piece of wing in his mouth, and um, the butterfly flew away. And of course you have the chaps who, who've taken the joke a bit too far and they made themselves into Rafa, you know? <laughs> so the chap doesn't know where to go. Here is a, a, the same strategy, but played differently. And these are called, well, they're little fellows. And the real head is down there. And that's the body. And the abdomen ends over there. That is the false head and the false antennae. Uh, again over here, that is the real head. And all these lines in the wing, if you see, they draw the attention to that false head at the back, which is identical to the real head and the false antennae. And here again, we have three-headed butterfly. That's the head of the fellow, and here's another head, a spare head, and another head. <laughs> and this is what happens when they get attacked. So they can concentrate on the flower, they can probe the nectar, and meanwhile, this, this things wave around the breeze. And anybody any, coming along with things, that's the head, because it's the brightest part of the butterfly and all that. And he comes and pecks that off, and um, you have a very vulgar colloquial expression in America to describe that. And this chat flies away. Now, all the tails are not false heads. These are used for aer aerobatics. These butterflies can fly very fast, these three of them, and they tend to survive by flying very fast and being able to do all sorts of acrobatics in the air, aerobatics in the air. And you see a bird has a very small mouth, or a bat for that matter. Now, to get that small mouth onto something that is moving is not at all easy. They don't have hands or nets or something. And if this butterfly manages to jig a little bit even, that's enough for the bird to go on sled. So they are very fast flyers and they use those tails for these purposes. This chap has made a tail and other appendages to break up his outline. So if he goes and sits on the bark somewhere, he's broken up his outline, it's not one single thing anymore. And of course he's got a second line over here, so you, you won't see what this chap is. You can't, you can't recognize the outline. Now, Different butterflies are found in different places. Over most of India, we have the same type of uh, at low elevation on the plains, we have the same butterflies. But once the hills start, the vegetation changes at different elevation, and that supports different butterfly species. So this is a low elevation rainforest in, in Arunachal, tropical forest, and this is the sort of butter these are the sort of butterflies it supports. And uh, rather colourful ones. Once you go a little higher, this is a oak forest as in Lando, and um, this is the sort of butterfly that supports. And you go up where Theo has taken us. This is the, the Karvan Pass in Ladakh. And uh, you have a different set of butterflies occupying this level. Now, these butterflies don't go up and down. We found that they are bound to their area by the plants. So although they are highly mobile, yet they stay in the vicinity of the food plant, where the caterpillar eats. Each butterfly has its own food plant. Some plants support many butterflies, and some plants don't support any. So these chaps are bound to their altitudinal belt, not by their inability to go up or down, but by the presence of the food plant. Now, butterflies vary over the range. Just like in humans, we have, we have uh, people from the north, from Europe, the Caucasians, the Chinese, the Africans, they look different. The same thing happened in butterflies. This is the same species of butterfly which occurs along the Himalayan area. And this is found in Kulu, in Himachal Pradesh. This is found here in the center of Masuri and Goma, Uttarakhand and Nepal. And this is found in Sikkim. So as humidity increases, the butterfly gets darker. That's also seen in wet and dry season form. If a butterfly emerges in summer, it's paler, and if it comes out during the monsoon, it's darker. Some butterflies don't wear it well. This is the painted lady. You find the same thing in, the, in Northern America. You find the same thing in Europe. You find the same thing in Africa, the same thing in Asia. You put specimens from all these continents together, they're identical. There was a ship which was uh, sailing during the 1930s, and they had a swarm of butterflies bow 
So it's got some kind of Indian for identification. And it turned out to be this painted lady butterflies. At the time, the ship was 200 miles from the nearest land. So it was a 300 kilometer non-stop flight, and these guys had moved on. They didn't, they didn't stop at the ship. They moved on. So they, they're capable of very, very long flights. This is a case of a, uh, I'm not sure. It's called the Bath Light, and it's, it got the name Bath Light from the town of Bath in England, where it was first recorded. It was found in temperate, it is found in temperate Asia, all the way to Japan, all over Europe. And in India, it was found in the trans area of Himachal Pradesh. So in the 1930s, it had been recorded as only from there. In 1961, we got it in Bhimta. In 1978, it had been recorded from eastern Manipur, and now it has been recorded from Manipur. So it's moving, moving eastwards into the tropical, it jumped the Himalayan, came into a tropical area, from a temperate zone, it came to a tropical zone, and it's moved down, and it's probably moving further south. And the reason for that is a plant called the Virginia pepergrass, North American weed, which came along to India by mistake with wheat shipments during the 1950s. So when the wheat was distributed all over India, the women, they cleaned the wheat and they threw out these seeds. And these seeds germinated and found the climate nice. And uh, they started growing. And this butterfly somehow discovered that. And when it discovered that, it leapt over the Himalaya and it's moved all the way down. So butterflies do change their way. They don't stay in one place. They are in all senses of the world. These are common butterflies, which are found in degraded areas. So their presence of absence, they're not, they're not threatened, their presence of absence doesn't mean anything, you can't attach much meaning to it. And then you have specialized butterflies. These butterflies are only found in forests. So if their population drops or rises, it means something. It means that there are certain changes in the habitat, which is either negative or positive for these fellows. Right? We had some talks yesterday talking about under what pressure. I think uh, uh, Ram had mentioned about the, the forest cover in India. We have a very sm a small amount of forest, very small amount of natural habitat. We're supporting over a billion people. And that indeed is good news. But we don't have any extinctions so far. And nor are there any foreseeable extinctions. There's only one butterfly which has been in a, a relic species in the Western Ghats, at the tip of the Western Ghats in Kerala. And it has been on the verge of extinction since the 1920s when it was discovered. So it's, it's still around, it's healthy and it's doing fine. So that, that's as bad as it gets and it's doing well. The rest are fine. Um, we have many, maybe out of the, out of the 1500 species, I'm sorry, uh, it, it's found in the Indian sub-region, including Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bhutan and, and Burma also, right? Bangladesh. And in India, there are about 1300 species. And in, out of the 1,300 species, about 300 are endemic, so they are not found anywhere else. So we are morally responsible for these <coughs> butterflies. Yeah. Some very pretty ones. And uh, I'm sorry, what am I talking about? Okay, the, the, proce the, the process of discovering butterflies and all is not over yet. These are some recently described butterflies and moths. And uh, this was described as recently as uh, 2006. Sorry, this one and 2007, I think, these lots, and this, uh, no, sorry, this is 2006, this is 2010, again 2010, so the, uh, and uh, last month in August, uh, species was described from Arunachal Pradesh. So there's still a lot of work to be done, and, uh, yeah, Steve, can I have it? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, the, these are the files, the box, it's not even Okay, I just took it from the moth. This is the world's largest insect. It's called the Atlas moth. And uh, just to show you adaptation, they don't have a mouth, they can't eat anything. So they depend on fat stored in the abdomen. Naturally, because they have a limited food supply, they don't fly too much. So they have to spend the whole day, they want that big, and they have to spend the whole day hiding, surviving, and they're very delicious. They're like, 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 like chocolate bonbons. <laughs> and, uh, what they've done, they have to survive, they make these transparent windows in the wing. Yeah? So, and this white light is transparent. So when it's sitting among the leaves of the tree, you're looking through the moth. It breaks up its outline completely. So the inner part of the moth is broken up. It looks like several different things, a lot of different leaves together. 
And beyond this pink line, you will see a very angry looking snake. <laughs> and the brightest part of the moth is the head of the snake. So anybody who happens to spot this moth will first look at the snake. And he won't wait to find out what it is. <laughs> uh, these are poisonous moths. These are the, the cyanide producers. The extremely bright hair. And uh, the alarm moths, they went to frighten. You, you saw that we, we saw eye spots where they were diverting attack. They said, come and attack, but attack the wrong place. And these chefs are saying, don't even try it. <laughs> Anything with eyes that size is going to be dangerous. So, and then you have moths that mimic bees. When it comes out of the pupa, it has colors in its wings. And as soon as the wings dry, it drops its wings and the colors drop off. And then it has these transparent wings, like a moth, a like thing. And okay, since we are in Masuri, and, uh, I just want to point out, Steve, you move to um, sorry. Um, in the 1920s, there was a person called uh, Scott, Frederick Scott, I think. So he was working here in Masuri, I believe here in Andrew, and he was studying hawk moths. And on the basis of his work and the work of um, some other people in South India and Shillong, there were three main stations. They did a, an excellent book from the Fauna Fra of British India series on this particular moth family, published in 1937. And they have very detailed distributions and all that. And when we started studying, uh, identifying our moths, we collected moths in the 70s, but it was only in the 80s that I started identifying them. And it turned out that um, the moths recorded from our place in Jones State, we had 77 hawk moth species. And out of them, 30 had not been recorded from the rest of Malay by Bell and Scott. So from Masuri, 30, so almost half of them were new. And these half that had been new were all from the eastern Himalaya. So, we, uh, on the basis of this, this shift, I was wondering what it signified. The plants that they eat are the same, that had not changed, the population of the plants had not changed, so something else had changed. The only other thing that could have changed are temperature and humidity. Now, again, temperature had not changed, so the humidity had changed. And humidity again, it had not really changed, but what had changed was that the winters were not so dry anymore. These hot moths, they pupate underground. And if the mud dries out, the pupa dries out, and the moth dies. But if the, there is a certain minimum amount of soil humidity, the pupa survives and they can colonize the area. But these chaps had, been, had moved in in the past uh, 50 years and they were thriving. And they probably in Masuri, I found, I found this one in Simla too. So it's, it's gone past Masuri. So they have shifted to this western Himalaya, a large amount of them have shifted to the western Himalaya in the past 50 years. And that means soil humidity levels have changed. And that, of course, is very good news because it means the Precipitation is being held back longer in the soil and not, not being rushed into the rivers and causing floods. So I would very much like to, in the years to come, to do a uh, confirmatory survey here and find out what the hot moths are here now, whether these 30 species are found in two or not. Okay? That's the biggest threat to insect immunity, of course, as far as fire is not collecting, it's not, it's not uh, anything else. That is the biggest danger, followed by habitat destruction. If you, if you go and hack and chop everything up, that is the, the danger to the communities. Thank you.